if we had absolutely free will as individuals, we would, each and every one, be completely happy. Because we would choose to will whatever the circumstances are that we are living through. Even if you are in solitary confinement, serving a life sentence, you would choose that that's what you want. Yeah. And you would be yeah. the happiest yeah. man on the or planet. Or at least that would be the smartest thing to do. You would say, you yeah. would think by well, yourself, okay, it's smarter to just really want this, and then you enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. But we don't, we can't do that. We experience something that we call free will, because our choices are computationally reducible. Nothing in the universe knows in advance what our predetermined choices are going to be. Your life's not about you, so it's not about making the right choices. That's not what it's about. Mm. No. If you remove that, if you remove those colored glasses, that your life is about you and therefore your individual choices are what determine the meaning of it all, remove yeah. that. What yeah. remains yeah. is this unfathomably incomprehensible system called the universe and you are bang in the middle of it. You are a part of it. And it's computationally irreducible. It does not know itself until it plays itself out. And you are the eyes through which it's doing that. And it's not about you, it's about it. But you play a role. We usually think of free will as necessary to experience meaning in life. Because if all our choices would be determined, we would be like puppets running a script which gives most people a sense of meaninglessness. But in this video, I'm going to look more carefully at why we exactly want free will so badly in the first place. And I'm gonna do that with philosopher and the director of the Essencia Foundation, Bernardo Castro. In the whole free will versus determinism debate, I think Bernardo Castro brings a refreshing and weird point of view. He namely thinks that we don't have free will, but that that, in the end, might give us more meaning in life. The association between meaning and free choice is inconsequential. Now, because it's not about choosing, it's about witnessing the thing play itself out. Experiencing life as it plays out through you. Yeah. It, it, or, yeah, the observation is through you, but uh, yeah. life yeah, plays out plays through out, everything. It plays out its thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, there, and it cannot yeah. know itself until and unless it plays itself out. One of the main points we touched upon in our conversation is the notion of computational irreducibility. The idea that even though our universe uh, might be deterministic, it's not deterministic in a algorithmic way, in a sense that via super fast computers you could speed things up to take sort of this God position and to see where the movie ends while it's still playing. So there's no fast forwarding in a sense. So our lives um, in that sense cannot be calculated. It cannot be known um, what our choices are up until the moment that we make those cho choices, even though those choices might be deterministic. So this is like, was a sort of a, um, a mind twister for me, but very interesting to discuss with Bernardo. And also how you regard your own life. I mean, you sit in the cinema, watch the movie Bernardo play out and just enjoy the ride with the ups and downs. Bernardo Castro as an individual, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a movie too. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. And if you are the eyes, the metacognitive eyes, that are part of the system, yeah. to bear witness to it, to it playing itself out, why is that not meaningful? I mean, this, this is the deepest meaning <coughs> imaginable. To say that your choices are determined doesn't mean that you are unimportant. It take you out of the system and it doesn't yeah. play itself out. Before we go to the full conversation between me and Bernardo, I'd like to ask you that if you like the content we are bringing with the Essentia Foundation, please like, subscribe and comment and help us grow this uh, movement, as I like to call it. Um, but now let's move on to the video that could not not have been made. I wanted to make this video because we had a phone call a couple of weeks ago and in which you sort of, we firstly discussed uh, your position on free will and you telling me that you had your doubts if we have it and you elaborated on it and we hung up and somehow it just bonded with me and then you came out with an essay on our uh, Essentia websites channel and um, it's just 
not been keeping me up at night. My kids keep me up at night, not <laughs> my free will <laughs> ponderings, but uh, still the question, do I have free will or not? And mainly, why am I so bothered with it in the first place? Because why do I want it so badly? For me, free will has always been sort of uh, a necessity to have meaning in life. I ah, have always uh, wanted to have free will. Otherwise, so, life is not meaningful. Exactly. So maybe first that question, why do many people or we or most people want it so badly? I think it's because of what you just said. There is this link that people make between having free will and their lives having meaning. Yeah. That um, if everything is determined, then it's like balls on a billiard table. Everything is set from the get-go yeah. and then you just have to go through the moves but there is no decision that could make things different yeah. uh, and in that sense if life is just you know playing the record mm -hmm. and the record is determined then, then there is a perceived sense in which life is meaningless yeah um, I think that's a profoundly wrong uh, line of thought um, and that's motivated by this strong illusion we have, especially in, in, in Western societies, of personal agency, which ties in with this notion that um, your life is about you and my life is about me. We yeah. are this personal agent, in some sense, separate from nature. Uh, we are mental and the rest of the nature is not mental, so we are sort of aliens in here. The world is of a completely different nature than we are yep. from the inside. And so we are separate and individual. Um, so for our little lives, as these tiny little specks of dust walking around a little rock, for that life to have meaning, this personal agent has at the very least to be able to make choices and yep. set its destiny yeah. in some way, yeah. otherwise it's just an automatic play of predetermined yeah. moves. And it's like a dark joke in a sense, right, from the yeah. cosmos. Yeah. And, and that's what jails us. Yeah. It's this need for that kind of illusory freedom mm. that confines us, yeah. because it prevents us from, from seeing the horizon, from, from, from taking notice of what yeah. is really going on. Yeah, and before sort of giving your take on it, uh, which you sort of have written about in your books and also in your essay. I want to dive into sort of more the whole uh, debate in the first place. And that brings us, of course, to the question of determinism. And um, a famous notion is that of Laplace's demon, sort of, I think it was a mathematician or... Yeah. yeah who said that um, if there were sort of an outside position to look at the universe and we know the universal laws of physics, then you could just play out everything. You could compute sort of exactly Bernardo's life, um, the necessity of, of this mo film being made, everything, everything. You could know it all. And so like a extreme form of determinism. And people, I think, long believed in that, right? If we just had to look at physics, Newton, etc. So what's your take on that? Uh, is that still compatible? Are we determined? How, how do you feel about that Laplace's demon? Would that take meaning out of life if this demon could exist in principle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's the strange thing is that it can also give us uh, some, it can relax us a bit, right? Because then it doesn't really matter my choices. I'm somehow determined. And if I could convince you that it's impossible for that demon to exist, what, would it change? Um, it would make, make me feel a bit more responsible, morally at least, if I have free will. So it would come back to the meaning of life. Yeah. If, whether yeah. the Laplace. And it would be more exciting. The universe would be a more exciting place, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. There is a concept in computer science <laughs> called computational irreducibility. Yeah. Check. And it's key for, for this topic. Um, for simple systems like. Um, Billard's table. If you have the necessary data, like you know what the angle is of the Q-tip, how strong it will hit, and the texture of the tip, you can compute where all the balls yeah. are going to go yeah. uh, in the interval uh, in which the Q-tip is moving. So before it even hits the ball, a computer can already, boom, it tells you that's the Laplace's demon in yeah. this case. Yeah. In the case of the Billard table, we can do that because it's a very simple system. We yeah. can make many simplifications. We can idealize certain parameters. 
that will lead to very small errors in the yeah. computation. So we can calculate the future state of the billiard table with the balls in it yeah. much faster than it takes the balls to play out and get to their final positions. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a simple system. But there are systems that are very complex and they are computationally, computationally irreducible. In yeah. other words, the fastest possible way to know the future state of the system is to let the system play out. Mm. It is to let the balls yeah. go to their yeah. final destinations. There yeah. is no way that one could compute it faster mm. yeah. because it's just too complex. Yeah. Your computations would be more complex than if you just let the states play out. In the case of the universe, the future state of the universe is computationally irreducible because mm. it would take a computer bigger than the universe to calculate it faster than the universe. Yeah. In other words, the only way for the universe to know where it's going is to go. Even if the universe is completely deterministic, it cannot know and nothing with it, within it can mm. know where it's going to go unless, unless it, it goes. actually goes. Yeah. So the only way for you to know in a deterministic system that is complex enough what's going to happen is to let it happen mm. and witness it, is to observe it. Yeah. So, and it's in that sense that determinism, uh, I'm not for determinism and I'm not for uh, libertarian free will. I think the yeah. question is senseless. Uh, so I'm not... I'm That's not, the position that you truly have free will, that you can really sort of go and not go against... Yeah, universe, that would be libertarian free yeah. will. We have complete free will. Yeah. And, and so, so I'm not pro or against it. I think the question makes no sense. We can yeah. talk about it. But uh, regardless of that, if you're linking the meaning of life to advance knowledge of what's going to happen, um, or the lack of, the, of meaning in life with advanced knowledge of mm -hmm. what's going to happen. In other words, if you know what's going to happen, then going through the moves, living life is pointless. Yeah, that's what you then say to yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you're right. Mm. But you don't need to worry about it because there is no way to know where it's going to end up unless yeah, you, you go cannot, through the moves. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is intrinsic meaning in going through the moves because it's the you're only way. You surprise itself, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it goes even deeper. There is an important sense in which to know what the universe is, mm -hmm you have to know where it's going. Mm. Because it's what it's doing that gives the hints you need to speculate in an educated way yeah. about what it is, what mm. it truly is. Because if it has certain inherent dispositions, it, those dispositions will steer the universe in a certain direction. So to know those dispositions and therefore to know what the universe is, you need to know where it's going to go. But if you can't predict where it's going to go because it's a computationally, computationally irreducible problem, then going through the deterministic moves is what will allow the universe yeah. to know what it is. Yeah. It needs to go through its own computation, move forwards to know where it's going, to know, yeah. But to it know does, itself. To yeah, to know itself. But that does imply a sort of uh, algorithm, a set of rules that sort of computes from the initial state. And is that there? I mean, is there or... Is there randomness involved? I don't think so. I think randomness is the word we use when we don't know. Um, people like to say that when Einstein said that uh, God doesn't play dice, that he was wrong. He was wrong in a very restrictive sense that uh, in quantum physics, Bell's theorem shows that uh, local hidden variables are incompatible with experimental results. So he was wrong in that restricted sense. But in the general sense, does God play dice? I suspect he was right. And I, uh, I'll tell you why. R randomness is an empty concept. It's an empty drawer that we sort of reserve for, for the things that we don't yet understand. Mm -hmm. If we don't understand how things happen, oh, it's random. Um, and, and we use this word exactly in this sense. Um, in engineering, there is this concept called signal to noise ratio. And if your signal is sufficiently bigger than the noise, then you can ignore the noise. Yeah. Now we say the noise is random because we can't model it, but it's not fundamentally random. 
noises, electromagnetic interference from all kinds of sources yeah, yeah, that you yeah. don't take into account, yeah. calculations that are too complex for you to yeah. run, yeah. the influence of ionic particles coming from the sun that you didn't measure. They are all determined. When you throw a coin and the coin lands with heads or tails yeah. up, that's completely determined by air pressure, air flow, the yeah. angle and force of your throw. Yeah. But we say it's random because we can't compute it or it's not practical to compute it. So we use already the word random routinely as a shorthand for all the stuff that we don't know and we don't understand yeah. or we didn't measure or we can't compute. And in my view, that's the only sensible way to use the word random. There is no fundamental randomness. But if we say that, that uh, you have to go through the, the states and there's no way fast and just go through them, that indeed relaxes a bit sort of the whole uh, problem with determinism. Uh, the states of the universe as a whole. Yeah, as a, we as can, a, yeah. we can calculate, predict states of simpler physical systems. Yeah, exactly. But can we predict like human, can we predict our, our own future? No. No, no, we cannot predict the choices we will make. Uh, I think they are philosophically necessitated. Mm -hmm. Our choices are a consequence, consequence of what we are. Yeah. And we cannot not be what we are. So in that sense, there is no room to play here. Mm. Our choices are a function of what we are and we are what we are. And thereby it is determined. In a sense. There is a strong philosophical sense in which you could say the choices are determined, but yeah. they are determined by us, which is compatible with free will. Because free will is not the statement that your choices are random. That's not what the intuition of free will tells you. Random choices are not free. Yeah. Because you don't make them, they are random. Yeah, that's the difficulty, right? Because we say we don't want determinism, a lot of people, then you want free will, but the opposite of determinism is Randomness. randomness, yeah, and we don't mean randomness. We don't mean that. No. And the problem is there's nothing in between. There is no semantic space in between. Mm. And that's why the very concept of free will is malformed. Uh, what most people mean by free will is that my choices are determined, but they are determined by me, mm, yeah. by my preferences, my tastes, my yeah, plans, yeah. my wishes, my fears, everything. And you say they are not? And I say they are determined by what nature is. They are clearly not determined by us alone because we are not in a vacuum. Uh, there are lots of input variables yeah, into yeah. the system that we are. Uh, yeah. And the consequence of all of that input are the choices we make. Uh, if we had absolutely free will as individuals, we would each and every one be completely happy because we would choose to will whatever the circumstances are that we are living through. Even if you are in solitary confinement, serving a life sentence, you would choose that that's what you want. Yeah. And you would be yeah. the happiest yeah. man on the or planet. Or at least that would be the smartest thing to do. You would say, you yeah. would think by well, yourself, okay, it's smarter to just really want this and then you enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. But we don't. We can't do that. Uh, we don't choose who we fall in love with. Yeah. We don't choose what we like to do and what we don't like to do. Yeah. Uh, do you choose your next thought? Do yeah. you choose your emotions? If you did, you would never feel angry, you, yeah. do, you would never feel depressed, you would never feel mm. anxious. What the hell do we choose? Yeah. Uh, our choices are determined by nature and there is a lot more to nature than the ego. There is a lot more to us than the ego. There are all the layers yeah. of the so-called unconscious. Yeah, because let's unpack pack that because I think here you are on par with materialists saying, like for instance, someone like Sam Harris, I don't know if he he really identifies as being a materialist, but if I listen to a lot of things he's saying, it does seem to me he is. But um, it's a strongly uh, opposing the idea that we have free will, right? And he doesn't see the problem, even he sees it as sort of a, a good thing to, because it makes you more compassionate to people who we normally see as immoral, because you then could argue they uh, couldn't really do uh, else. Uh, so they couldn't really behave in a different way. But it, that, of course, also poses us for a big problem. And also it poses us for a problem. Why is it that we then experience that we have free will, or at least we think? So it's this whole difficulty. So from how do you look at that? Sort of like the more materialist way in how it is normally denied, but also then the issue how to account uh, from a materialist viewpoint that we do experience it because that I find difficult. And this also, I think, is what is known as compatibilism. 
that it is that you say I'm a materialist, everything is determined, but still uh, you, we somehow can have free will. And then, <laughs> yeah, I usually yeah. don't yeah. like this kind of word dance. Um, so I'll, I'll try to, to be yeah. straightforward. So a couple of questions, but yeah. yeah. We experience something that we call free will because our choices are computationally reducible. Mm. Nothing in the universe knows in advance what our predetermined choices are going to be. In other words, by witnessing the unfolding of that which we are, what we are determines our choices, what nature is determines our choices. Since that is unknown to nature before it plays mm -hmm. out, we experience each and every choice as a novelty. Ah, is this Libet's experiment in the no, 80s? No, 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 that's, 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 that's something different? Something, no, that's something else. Uh, uh, I think Libet's experiment says absolutely nothing about free will. <laughs> okay, but, but why I'm saying this is because in that experiment, um, in, a, in brain scanners or whatever, uh, the decision is sort of noticed, sort of measured before um, the participants in the experiment uh, experience their free will choice themselves. Yeah. And, and when you now say witness something that is determined, that's why I thought of that experiment. No, no, it's, it's different. In Libet's experiments, you would have a volunteer uh, make a decision and then the, the, the volunteer is then asked, press the button the moment you make a decision. But he he's instrumented with an EEG mm -hmm. cap, mm -hmm. so scientists can monitor mm -hmm. the brain function of that individual. And as it turns out, there is a building potential and a certain pattern of brain activity that are measurable uh, several milliseconds before the volunteer actually presses yeah. the button. Yeah. And that used, has been used in old times as an argument against free will. And the argument is, or your choice is be has been determined by your brain. Uh, and, and only afterwards you press the button. Yeah, exactly. Oh, since then, uh, that experiment, to a large extent, has been debunked on methodological grounds. There are all kinds of methodology problems related to that experiment. Okay. So it's questionable whether you can even say anything about it. But su let's suppose, let's be uh, um, charitable and suppose that, okay, there's some, still something to be said. How could we account for that experiment in a way that remains compatible with free will? Yeah. So I'm going to make a case for free will now, even though I, I don't believe it. Okay, and, check, uh, let's it's, go. it's intellectual honesty, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the conclusion conflates um, consciousness with meta-consciousness. Um, there is a difference between the two. Uh, there is the experience of making a decision, which mm -hmm. is the making of the decision. Yeah. The making of a decision is a mental process. Then mind has to take note of that mental process. Yeah. You, you have to know that you've made an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have to know that before you... Only by knowing that you've made an experience can you press the button. Yeah. You have to be able to report to yourself that you have oh, yeah. made, made a, a choice. A, that yeah. you have made a choice. In other words, to speak technical language, you have to re-represent the mental process that is the choice. And that re-representation is a mirroring in a higher level of cognition of an event that has already taken place in a lower yeah. level of cognition. Yeah. This is a re-representation. It and takes we know, some time and therefore... And yeah. that takes some time. So there is time that your mind takes between mm. making a decision and yeah. reporting to itself that it has made yeah. a decision. Yeah. And that's what accounts for wow. that. Uh, yeah. So it says nothing at all about okay, free will. Okay, yeah, <laughs> precisely. Because then people would say it was unconsciously that you make that decision, but it might have been conscious, but not meta. It depends on how you define consciousness yeah. and unconsciousness. Yeah. Many people conflate consciousness with meta consciousness. Yeah. Uh, so in, in that case, you could say it's an unconscious decision. I think that's wrong, but uh, yeah. The, the, the viewpoint of compatibilism, so it says that um, uh, I, I've been watching videos online, of even physicists and people who say like it's a category error that you can ha have on a particle level, say you're fully deterministic, uh, but on the human macro level, you still have free will as a somehow emergent property. <laughs> It makes me laugh because I just cannot get my head around it. But this is, in a sense, what compatibilism is about, or is it, or how would you define uh, it? Philosophers love to dance on the head of a pin with these conceptual games. Um, 
I think the question is unimportant. Yeah, but what, but uh, just in your words, what is compatibilism? What, compatibilism what is, is the notion that free will is compatible with determinism. That yeah. there is a sense in which you can construe the idea of free will that does not contradict the notion of determinism. How do they do that? What's the trick there if, we, if, you, if I ask you to, to fix that? The trick me. is to say, although our choices are determined, experientially everything plays out as though they were not determined. Mm. So you get to have your experience of free will, even mm. though fundamentally there is no free will. Mm. That's essentially and what it. sort of interests me is, um, I listened to Joshua Bach, who's like a computer scientist on a Kurt Jamungo podcast. He says like, it's like a story the system tells itself, like it's all computation and then the computer tells itself that. And I also saw arguments that somehow that experiencing free will would be beneficial, right? It would be beneficial morally in a sense that it would, would induce more moral behavior in groups when people think they are free and versus unfree. And there are also experiments that point to that. None of them I think are absolutely conclusive, but it does point to the fact that if you prime people like you don't have free will, it will induce more immoral behavior. So that's sort of also a moral dilemma we have here. So I was just wondering, did evolution sort of make us believe we have free will? Does it have a function? Would Darwin say free will has a function, sort of evolutionary? It's a matter of how committed you are to wanting to know the truth as opposed to wanting something that is functionally useful. Please right. explain. Is, free, if, is the notion of free will functionally useful? Hmm. So you ignore whether it's true or not. Is it useful? If it is useful, let's embrace it. Yeah, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. My mind is set up in such a way I, that I'm too committed to truth. I, yeah. I, I can't knowingly deceive myself. Yeah. Of course I deceive myself unknowingly, but <clears throat> like all yeah. of us. But I am incapable of saying, okay, I will buy into this because it's useful. Yeah. So th yeah. that's the first level. Uh, so in that first level, I would say, you, it's missing the point. Aren't we talking about whether free will exists or not? So let's focus on that. Yeah, yeah. Why are we going to talk about whether it's useful or what, yeah, what yeah, function yeah. it's you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But uh, there is a second level in which I can give you a different answer, which is that uh, free will as a concept only seems functional and necessary if we make some unexamined and unnecessary assumptions. Okay. To, to make it concrete, I'll give yeah. you first example. If you make the assumption that the justice system has to be based on the idea of revenge, mm -hmm. payback, mm -hmm. then you need free will. Hmm. Because you can only take revenge against an action that was freely done. Yeah. And now there will be payback. Yeah, you won't, now revenge, you won't revenge a lion sort of like... Of course not. Killing another animal and eating it. There it's was like, no free will, he just instinctively does it, but with humans we say, okay, exactly. we can re tornado, take revenge on you. Yeah, a tornado comes, destroys your house. Oh, you want to take, you want to punish the tornado. Yeah. Yeah. It's silly, no free right? Will. Yeah. Check. So if we have a justice system that is based on the idea of punishment, then free will is yeah. functional. Yeah. You, are, you even need it. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. have a problem if you sort of uh, put it in the, in the, in the bin. Yeah. yeah. But it's ridiculous to base a judicial system on the idea of punishment. Hmm. We don't need to do that. And it's silly to do it. The judicial s system should be based on the idea of preventing future crime. Hmm. And True. that's what it's all about. Yeah. You want to prevent future crime. So I don't think we need the, the idea of punishment, revenge, payback to have a, a proper judicial system. What we need are two concepts that we do Mm -hmm. see in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. One is um, uh, deterrence and the other one is uh, preemption. So in the Netherlands if you commit a crime and you are considered guilty of that crime, first you get jail sentence which is deterrent. It's to tell other people who could commit a crime that uh, this is the consequence yeah. if they do commit that crime. And even if everything is determined, um, deterrence is a variable that there's also an input to the, to the deterministic equation. Now, what I will do in a determined manner depends on the variables that I collect as input. So if an input changes, then my choice changes. It's still determined, 
but it's determined on the basis of the input. So if everybody knows that uh, people who are caught after committing a crime is going to go to jail and lose their freedom for a number of years, mm -hmm. that's a variable. Yeah. It goes into the computation of whether people will commit another crime or not. Yeah. So deterrence is important and it's a completely valid idea in a deterministic world. Yeah. And I'm not defending determinism. I think determinism and free will, they are... Uh, um, yeah nonsensical concepts, like asking whether the number five is married or single. That's the same kind of question. But uh, let me pretend yeah. that, uh, that... But it's not like you're saying that through free will we create this mechanism of deterrence, um, because that's also universally, it's all determined, right? Yes. Yeah. yes, but the fact that it's determined doesn't mean that it doesn't need to play out, yeah. because it's computationally reducible. Yeah. So it has to play out. Yeah. For the universe to get whatever it wants to get, yeah. Yeah. it has to play itself out. Yeah. But everything that happens in nature is a function of what nature is. It can't be anything else. Um, and so there is a sense in which it is, de it is determined. Um, but a, just, a judici judicial system can be based on prison term for deterrence, and then what in the Netherlands we call TBS. Uh, which is preemption, and that is after you served your prison sentence, psychiatrists yeah. will evaluate what is the chance that you will that you will recur and commit a crime again. Yeah. If they think that the chance is high, yeah. you are still detained in a psychiatric facility, yeah. and and that has nothing to do with payback, punishment. Mm -hmm. The whole thing still holds water, even if determinism were true. Yeah. Because preemption is a variable that gets computed mm. into the equation about whether you would do something or not. Yeah. And uh, uh, not preemption, a deterrence. And, and preemption also holds. Uh, actually, it's based on a form of determinism. Psychiatrists will evaluate whether your intrinsic disposition. Yeah, you were determined to do it. Yeah. And there are a lot, I mean, there are a lot of problems with our system, but I do agree internationally that, that it's pretty, pretty well organized in the Netherlands. The thing that sort of interests me is because it, it always it also goes the other way around, right? If you say sort of like like uh, um, criminality sort of is determined, you also say that people are highly successful who also like to think they got there through their own free will yeah. <laughs> are also to determine. <laughs> and this brings me to sort of the work of I don't know if you, if you know much about psychology, but uh, B. F. Skinner with behaviorism in the fifties. We sort of came up with this whole notion. He even had a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, right? Because he linked sort of our, our freedom also with our sense of dignity, right? Our stories of being a hero when you do the good stuff and uh, being the bad guy. And it's throughout human history that we tell ourselves these stories. And what is, what's your take on that? That sort of this notion of determinism also crushes this sort of our, our longing for these big stories of being dignified as the hero. It's all based on the same underlying delusion, which is this delusion of complete personal agency, as if we were separate from the rest of nature. Yeah. Um, which is an oppressive delusion because it sort of puts all the responsibility for the outcome of your life on you. So if you are a failure, you have only yourself to blame. Uh, but if you are successful, you know, you can beat your chest in front of the mirror until, until the, the chickens come, come home to roost. Um, and both are based on this notion of uh, intrinsic personal agency, which leads to the other delusion, which is your life's about you. Um, and they are pro profoundly oppressive notions. We, we, we don't recognize that because we take these notions for granted. We think yeah, it's yeah. just how things are. Um, but if you see through them, and you understand that uh, your personal agency is extremely superficial. Um, we are like the tornado, you know, we are just the two little eyes sitting at the tip of the tornado. What's going on underneath is not us. It's mm. all kind of impersonal mental processes, an ebb and flow of stuff that is nature. Not Bernardo Castrup or, or but are you in a sense, and you can agree a little bit with, with behaviorism on that in that. No, sense. no, no. I just no. I, you will never get me to agree to Skinner, because what he's saying is that there is no mind. There is only behavior. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And yeah. and that is this one of the stupidest ideas in the history of of human thought. 
So no, no, and certainly you're, you're never going to find a defender of behaviorism. I yeah. think behaviorism was a cultural sickness. Yeah. It was an ailment. But it is a sickness that sort of, it, it still pervades a lot of thinking, even in Silicon Valley. There's this author, Shoshana Zuboff, she wrote a book uh, called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, in which she makes a very strong point how Skinner's ideas are sort of on the, on the, on the, on the, night closet, you know, next to the bed of Silicon Valley, people want to nudge the world in sort of predicting our behavior and selling that, of course, to ad advertisement, etc. The whole philosophy that we can all be determined and Skinner had this idea of a super organism, you know, that we can have this like society without friction and stuff. And it's still, it's, it's scary in a sense, right? That this, a lot of this thinking is, is a lot of smart people in a sense believe this. Well, that, that's one aspect that behaviorism adopts, which is that uh, our mentation is modelable and predictable. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree with that. I think our psychology yeah. is much more predictable than most normal educated people on the streets uh, yeah. would ever guess. Yeah. Uh, we are profoundly influenceable in very subtle ways. That doesn't mean that behaviorism was right as a kind of approach to psychology that try to replace mental processes with external behavior, I think that's ridiculous, but that human mentation is modelable and predictable to some extent. That's undoubtedly true. Yeah, it has been they, proven and, by practice. Yeah, but they hope, hope that they can, can compute it through silicon and that you just sort of said it's irreducible also then in a sense our behavior. So that's like yeah, our behavior. Idle, idle hope that we can ever compute sort of what Bernardo will do tomorrow? Not in the full nuance of our behaviors, not with precision. No, exactly. Um, but um, most of our modeling efforts um, simplify things. We make, you know, uh, simplifying assumptions in the beginning. Yeah. And we can make them if we understand how, how much that we increase the error bar. So if, uh, if I can, for instance, um, when I'm modeling a fluid, uh, if I can disconsider all quantum effects and only model everything on the basis of the mm -hmm. electrostatic attraction of molecules, yeah. then I can, mo I can model fluid dynamics yeah. uh, in a very simple way, but um, enough to predict the yeah. phenomenon of relevance, like who my aircraft fly. Yeah, exactly. You know? What's important to you. Yeah. 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 So from <clears throat> that perspective, the simple aspects of human behavior that are relevant to selling a product, oh, those can be predicted. Yeah, exactly. And that's what they want. But their belief underneath that is that if only we understand the human mind better, we can, in principle, fully predict it. And that you I, say is no, that's, that's nonsense. No, right? because that's based on the assumption that the human mind has uh, hard limits has hard bound boundaries. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a bound system that has limited entropy within. Um, but I don't see the human mind as that. It, it doesn't have a, a, a hard boundary. A dissociative boundary is never perfect. Mm. It's porous. Mm. There is traffic of mental influences. Ah, and that you in cannot and sort of integrate in your calculations. So to, you... to model a human mind to perfection, you have to model the whole of the universe to perfection. Yeah. Because there isn't a hard boundary, there is an exchange of influences. Yeah. And the moment you open that door to model with perfection, yeah, now you have to go through the boundary and model everything else. Good luck with and that. And then you're back to your sort of computer that has to just as big as the it's universe. It's computationally reducible. Yeah. yeah. But uh, to model only certain superficial aspects of human behavior, like patterns of consumption, yeah. and to model that on a statistical basis, that's completely doable. Yeah, I wanted to think, there is this sort of notion, we talked a bit about compatibilism and how it can be compatible. And there's also this notion uh, of emergence, right? It's like a buzzword or a magic word, how somehow out of the determinism, a sort of free system can emerge. I want to just reflect with you on the whole notion of emergence. And then there's a distinction, right? People have like strong, strong emergence. Strong emergence would be like from that inanimate matter we get to consciousness, for instance? That's the only postulated instance of uh, strong. potentially strong emergence. Yeah. yeah, the difference is in weak emergence, you can reduce the properties of the emergent phenomenon to the properties of the underlying okay. lower level yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. You can do that, yeah. but it's not intuitive. Okay. 
For yeah. instance, you can deduce, in principle, you mm -hmm. can deduce the shapes of uh, sand dunes mm -hmm. based on complete knowledge of the characteristics of each sand grain and wind patterns. Yeah. So it is reducible, yeah. but it's not intuitive and it's not yeah. practical. Yeah. But it, it is possible, yeah. so much so that uh, we can model snowflakes and sand dunes on computers. Yeah. Not with perfection, uh, but they are modelable. Yeah. So this would be a weak emergence. Uh, a weakly emergent phenomenon is reducible to its underlying constituent. Complete knowledge of the constituent will lead to complete knowledge of the emergent phenomenon in principle. But that jump is either impractical or counterintuitive. Strong emergence is when you say complete knowledge of the underlying factors cannot be translated into knowledge of the properties of the emergence phenomenon. Mm. It's something utterly new. Yeah. And in that, it's in that sense that some people say consciousness is an emergent phenomenon of neuronal physiology. It's something completely incommensurable with yeah. neuronal physiology, but somehow arises from it. I find this a completely incoherent concept. It means exactly nothing. It's it pure hand-waving. Yeah. And is it, is it an appeal to magic in a sense? It's an appeal to magic. Yeah. It's a way to hide behind complexity. Yeah. Uh, that's what you do when you have no idea what you're talking about. But then you, you, you squint your eyes, you wave your hand and you say, and then behind all that complexity, something happens and uh, consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and so with the same, could, we, we could try to do the same for free wills because it's all determined. Yeah. Oh, but you do have free will, but you don't. Yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we already discussed a bit the problems on a so societally that we make, have to make a, um, it's just a big shift, right? We're addicted, in a sense, to this free will thinking in our uh, how we think about law, how we think about meaning. Sort of meaning, success in our lives, and how to sort of. I mean, if we would go to rehab, what would be your first sort of? What would be the first therapy session <laughs> to undo the underlying assumptions that lead to these delusions? And the number one underlying assumption is your life's about you. Hmm. Um, if that's what you truly believe, then you've got to have free will. Because otherwise you're just a pawn. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and everything is meaningless. We have to undo the assumption that uh, determinism in principle uh, entails computational reducibility. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. Something may be uh, fundamentally deterministic, but computationally irreducible. Yeah. And if you undo these two assumptions, now you can regard life in a completely different way and its meaning in a completely different, different way. Your life's not about you, so it's not about making the right choices. That's not what it's about. Mm. Now, if you remove that, if you remove those colored glasses that your life is about you and therefore your individual choices are what determine the meaning of it all, remove yeah. that. Yeah. What remains? Yeah. What remains? Yeah. It's this unfathomably incomprehensible system called the universe. And you are bang in the middle of it. You are a part of it. And it's computationally irreducible. It does not know itself until it plays itself out. And you are the eyes through which it's doing that. Mm. And it's not about you, it's about it. Mm. But you play a role. Yeah. Now, a, a, a computer is not about the CPU. Take the CPU out and nothing works. Um, an integrated organic system um, is such that every seeming part of it, I would say, they are not even parts, mm -hmm. uh, they are nominally parts, we identify them as parts, but they are just you know, one whole. But these seeming parts, if any one of them is removed, the system doesn't play itself out. Um, and we are that. Mm. Take us out of the equation and there are no eyes to see the universe play itself out. That's a deep, deep statement, yeah. Um, so, so, if you understand that your life's not about you, one, you're free. You, go, <laughs> you are free you from... You can relax, yeah. Oh, you can relax. You're yeah. free from that little voice telling you that you have to do this, you have to achieve that, otherwise everything's for nothing. No, that voice just dissolves, becomes a breeze. <laughs> um, and, and two, the association between meaning and free choice is inconsequential. Now, because it's not about choosing, 
It's about witnessing the thing play itself out. Experiencing life as it plays out through you. Yeah. It, it, or, yeah, the observation is through you, but uh, yeah. life yeah, plays out plays through out, everything. It plays out its thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, there, and it cannot yeah. know itself until and unless it plays itself out because yeah. it's computationally reducible. It can, yeah. The future state cannot be known and therefore mm. its own intrinsic dispositions cannot mm. be known yeah. because they are only known so far as they are expressed. Yeah. And they are expressed in playing the game, playing yeah. it out. Yeah. And if you are the eyes, the metacognitive eyes that are part of the system yeah. to bear witness to it, to it playing itself out, why is that not meaningful? I mean, this, this is the deepest meaning <coughs> imaginable. To say that your choices are determined doesn't mean that you are unimportant. Take you out of the system and it doesn't yeah. play itself out. And it brings something that uh, I found interesting after talking to uh, Chris Fuchs about cubism, that uh, that's in quantum theory, but the, the, the notion that every act of measurement of observation creates true novelty in the universe. That's his wording. Um, applied to this, I'd say that everything in the universe just does, I mean, does what it does, how it plays out. If we experience that, that experience in and of itself is something new in the universe. Of right? course. Yeah, and that, and that is beautiful, I think. Of course. But it does put you back in sort of an observing position, right? It's like sitting in a cinema, so then more the... Is that also how you regard your own life? I mean, you sit in the cinema, watch the movie Bernardo play out and just enjoy the ride. With the, the ups and downs? Bernardo Kastrup as an individual, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a movie too. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Uh, and you never had the idea that it sort of looped back that because you thought it was a movie, you made sort of decisions that you thought I, you wouldn't have made earlier on? For instance, when we had that call and you said stuff like that, and I was thinking, yeah, if I really sort of live this, there's this tendency in me to just not immoral behavior, but to just be lazy or, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's just, uh, you, you understand what I mean? Even, I mean, let me try to drill down to the core. We tend to mix up the idea that um, nature's behavior is determined by what it is and not random. We tend to mix that up with nature's behavior being mechanistic mm. in a simplistic and silly way. Yeah. This association is not what I have in mind. Mm. Like a script, like just running a script. Yeah, or an algorithm. Yeah. An yeah. algorithm is a particular form of classical computation. Uh, we, we know better than that these days. There are other ways of doing computation. You know, quantum computers operate in a completely different way. So when I say that um, every move in nature is in principle determined by what nature is mm -hmm. because there's no alternative to this. What else? No, other than random magic. No, yeah. even the throw of a dice doesn't count because it is determined. Uh, everything has to be determined by what nature is. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it's a tautology almost, right? Yeah, that I get. Yeah. So, but in saying that, I'm not saying that nature is an algorithm. And that's the important mm. distinction. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about in principle determination, not algorithmic determination. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, an important distinction, right? And, and the concept of will then, not, let's, let's skip the word free, but will. And also this, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a deep reader of Schopenhauer, but that's what pops up now in my mind. And you, you've written about Schopenhauer, right? It, how does it refer to his thinking or, or the other great philosophers, like the will of nature? Yeah, Schopenhauer saw every necessity in nature. Necessities like if you drop a stone, it will fall. Yeah. Um, and the river will flow downwards, not upwards. Mm -hmm. He saw those necessities as expressions of a natural will. Yeah. Um, stones fall because nature wants stones to fall. The river flows downhill because nature wants rivers to flow downhill and not yeah. up uphill. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think that is a profound insight that people misunderstand, mm. uh, including the world's leading Schopenhauerian scholar mm. who Be didn't even begin to understand Schopenhauer. No, how do they read that then? <laughs> they read it as the stone has a will, okay. the river has ah, a will. Okay. That's not what Schopenhauer ah, was saying. Okay. Schopenhauer yeah. is very clear 
that beyond human representations, mm -hmm. nature was unitary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that uh, space and time, the principle of individuation, was a, a, a cognitive thing that humans do. They don't belong outside. Mm. And outside, it's all unitary. So there are no stones. There are no rivers. There is only the one will of nature. I mean, that Schopenhauerian scholars can fail mm. to realize this when Schopenhauer has written repeatedly about this. He repeats himself all over these two gigantic volumes of the world as will and representation. And that people miss that. For me, it's like incomprehensible. And that someone like that can still be the editor of the new translations of Schopenhauer and okay, so this is like, a, big, a big side note you're making, but <laughs> how do they misunderstand it then? It's, it's through a sort of metaphysical okay. lens they have on. Is it sort of like... So what Schopenhauer is saying, and Schopenhauer was a determinist, and, and, and that's the most important and the simplest thing about Schopenhauer <laughs> that somehow people don't get it, is that... Um, the will as an experience of irresistible desire mm -hmm. is the necessity. It is the determination. Mm -hmm. When there is no outside world, because the will is the sum total of everything, according to Schopenhauer, the will is Schopenhauer's word for the universal mind. God, it is the universe, yeah. God, whatever <clears throat> you want. It, it, but God provided that you don't separate God from nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was no outside forces. Yeah. There is nothing that could make determinations beyond the will because the will is all there is. Yeah. And Schopenhauer is clear. He writes this explicitly. The will is all there is. Then what the will desires to do mm -hmm. is what the will must do. And what the will must do, because it is what it is, is the expression of its irresistible desire. The desire and the necessity are one and the same thing. And the word freedom then is sort of uh, not useful anymore, right? No, in sense, because of course not. You are always free in relation to something else, but mind in itself, is, if it's everything, what can it be free in yeah. relation to, right? So, yeah. so we say, uh, I go to work not because I want to go to work, but because society forces me to go to work if I am to survive. Yeah. But if there is only you, there is no external society. If you are the one mind that exists and you're the sum total of what exists, what you do will always be determined by what you are. Because yeah. otherwise it's randomness. And yeah. that's not what we mean by free will. Yeah. We don't mean that free will choices no, are random no, no, choices. No, no. So if you are that mind of nature, everything is determined by what you are. Every action you take mm -hmm. is determined by mm -hmm. what you are. But you experience that action taking as an expression of your irresistible desire to do that action. Because there is no other way you could experience that action. You're not being forced to do it by anything else. Mm, yeah, so you really want it. So the desire to do is the necessity to do. And the necessity to do, to do is the expression of the irresistible desire to do it. So the concept of free will has no meaning. Because it cannot be con contrasted with anything else. Necessity collapses with desire. Mm -hmm. They are one and the same thing. They are two words for the same thing. They are not I identical different things, I I different identical units in the sense that you can have two Volkswagen cars of the same year, model and make, but they are still two different cars. No. Necessity and, and, and will are the same car, the same unit. If you understand this, the whole no, hoopla about free will, just... I think I get it. I have to think, I have to really let this sink in. But a question I have right now is then, if we get back to sort of that notion of computational irreducib irreducibility, um, talking about Schopenhauer will, um, it makes me think that the universe could will something that goes against the laws. That's what we perceive on our end, sort of the regularities we see in that will. We call the laws. We call that the laws of physics, I guess, right? Um, it could change those, right, or update them so that that brings sort of us into a truly creative universe where things could could change. I don't know that. You don't know? No, no. no. The, the just to, to, to close the thought on Schopenhauer, when, when Schopenhauer would say that uh, 
the stone falls because nature irresistibly wants it to fall. Mm -hmm. What he's expressing is exactly what I said, that the necessity that we call gravity mm -hmm. is the expression of the irresistible will yeah. that mass attracts mass. Yeah. So th that's Schopenhauer. And now your question is, could the will will something other than what it's willing right now? Yeah, could it update itself or just think different day in the universe, let's do things differently. So it has to will itself to will something else. Yeah, that's yeah. Then it's still an expression of its irresistible will. It, it, you can't get out of this. Yeah. You, you can only loop around. Yeah, yeah it. okay, I get it, I get it. But on our end, from the human perspective, that could mean a different universe because then that is just part of the irresistible will. You know what I'm, or is this? Then sort of that would only mean that there are meta laws that produce mm. the laws we know, the laws of physics, the laws of nature. Yeah. And if there are those meta laws, then they are part of what nature is. Mm. And they have always been there. We just haven't detected mm. them yet. So we would just create a new layer of meta laws to reduce our laws to. But whatever you do, you cannot escape the notion that whatever is happening in nature is a function of what nature is. Yeah, and, and if, we, if we could go, go back to an initial state, hypothetically, um, and still it's compu computational irredu irreducible, would we end up with exactly the same universe then? This is one of those still play it thought out. experiments that um, I, I don't think help us in any way, because it's a scenario that can't happen. We can't go back. Yeah. You know, it, uh, we can speculate endlessly about it. If you put me on the spot and you, f and you force me to give an answer, I would say it will play out exactly like it played out. Because it played out the way it did, because nature is what it is. And it's useless to think about whether nature could have been something other than what it is. Mm. Because it's not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and then, yeah. If we, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think summing your thought up, Bernardo, um, is that sort of a deep meaning or um, uh, purpose can be derived in witnessing nature's will play out, right? So, so that's that's then. Um, but it does seem to me that I do have a say in how much I witness or not, in a sense. And, and that I regard then as my free will. So let's say, yeah, let's say the, the script of my life, how things go, I do not really have a say, I had to be here to record this video with you, but it, it does still feel that in the now, in the moment, I do have a bit of free will in how much I really take notice or am here right now, or my mind drifts off. Or is that all just nature? I mean, what's your, what are your thoughts here? It's all just nature, but recognizing this doesn't mean that, um, that we don't have to play our roles. Because even if nature is deterministic, and I'm not saying that it is, I'm saying that deterministic, determinism and free will as concepts have no meaning. It's like asking whether the number five is married or single. Uh, the question is inappropriate. But Let's pretend for a moment that things play out as if determinism existed. That would still not mean that life is futile. For instance, my understanding of this form of determinism doesn't mean that it's futile for me to talk about it. Because people would do whatever they would do anyway. Now that's false. That's not what I'm saying. Because my doing what I'm doing and people listening to what I'm saying now, is an input variable to the algorithm between quotes. Without that input variable, things wouldn't play out the way they will do, mm -hmm. because there is that input variable. In this particular case, I'm producing uh, your and other people's input variable. In the majority of my life, I am getting input variables from other people, mm -hmm. from the environment mm -hmm. about me. Without those input variables, I would have made a different calculation and mm -hmm. taken a different turn. So to say 
that everything is determined by what nature is doesn't mean that our actions as part of the natural unfolding are futile. No, they produce input variables yeah, for other yeah, parts yeah, of yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah. So we still have to play it out. Yeah, we still and, but have but to you do not have a say in, in, in creating those input variables or not. They will happen through you. It will happen. Yes, even your struggle with it. And, and, and maybe that's the most important point. Because we live in a society that is completely result-oriented, which makes absolute sense in business, but is a very poor um, conception of life. You know, we shouldn't import what makes sense in business to the whole of life. But we do import that. And, and we think that all that matters is the result. And then we lose sight of what is actually the important thing, which is the inner struggle. Um, when we struggle inwards with, oh, do I have three choices or not? Is the world determined or not? Does life have any meaning? And we think that what will have meaning is the outcome of that inner struggle, whether yeah. we got it right or yeah. whether we got we it wrong. We want to manifest that one thing or sort of, yeah. That's what we think. Avoid that other thing. We think the struggle is a means to an end. Yeah. And the value and the meaning of it all will depend on the outcome of that struggle and the decision, the choice that is made and what will play out as a function of that. Mm -hmm. I submit to you that the meaning is in the struggle. Mm. That's the end. The, the end is that inner observation yeah. of our own mental struggles. Yeah. That's what it's all about. That's what you're contributing to nature the day you die. Um, that, th those are the mm. insights, the key insights that you yeah. contribute. So it, it is about the process um, because the end is determined by what nature is. But it's computationally reducible, so it has to play itself it has to out play for out. nature it's to know itself. Process. It's about experiencing the process. It's about observing the process. And the process includes our inner struggles with, with the question with of free will. And, the and there's <laughs> really nothing in we can do to experience it more or less it is really what it is and it is really about experiencing it and you will go through the struggle oh man and you can struggle about going through the struggle yeah. and you but it will happen you see and now it is, i do I, I do okay if i i would now kick I, i'm not going to kick you but if i would or you can still uphold this worldview Bernardo. i live this worldview every day and it has given me fantastic peace of mind. Hmm. Like um, regret doesn't exist in my life. Guilt? Even, even the regret of pulling that uh, siren Serious? and getting tinnitus. Yeah. yeah. It is what it is. No guilt feelings or uh, because that is also no. Dirty, I have you forgiven have myself. Uh, yeah. Look, to forgive oneself and be kind to us to oneself, even when one expresses one's deepest evil is not incompatible with responsibility. Yeah. It's just a more adult way of dealing with oneself. Um, I, I am very much for personal responsibility. Um, and I don't think that requires uh, uh, libertarian free will hmm. at all. And by saying this, my saying this is not futile either, because you hearing this from me will be an input variable to your calculations. So it yeah. will influence your behavior. Um, um, and we see that as distinct parts because we don't have the overview of the unitary whole that nature mm -hmm. is. Nature is going through its own moves. Its means of understanding itself through playing itself out is us. So your life, my life, has inherent meaning. The struggle has inherent meaning. The regret, which may be senseless, has a meaning has because meaning. it's part of that unfolding. Yeah. And yeah. everything we got wrong is part of that unfolding. Yeah. Part of that unfolding is also the future crea cr futile creation of could have been scenarios. There is no could have been. There is only what is. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 I get you there. But the imagining of the could have been is part of the unfolding. Yeah. yeah. So it also plays a role. Yeah. Um, and and here it gets a bit sort of towards sort of the more esoteric notions of like Alan Watts with his dance or the, it's a dance of cre the, the dance of the universe. And I, I, I think you uh, actually like, I, I'm almost quoting you here in your essay. You say, say like, you know, it's about 
paying attention to what's going on, observing the dance of existence, taking it in. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and where people get it wrong, uh, let me try to play the role of the audience now. Some people <coughs> might say, but why are you saying this, Bernardo? Because whatever will be, will be anyway. So you're, you're telling me that I should pay attention to the unfolding yeah, of good, existence. Yeah, that's a good critique, yeah. It's yeah. futile. Why say it? Yeah. The thing is, it's not. Because my saying it is an input variable to your calculation. My saying this is unavoidable. It's an expression of na what nature is. But it's part of this unavoidable expression that I say what I say and you hear what you hear. You had to do it. And that becomes yeah. an input variable to your calculation about how you live your life. Yeah. So my saying this is part of, of the inner organism that is unfolding. Mm -hmm. If I wouldn't say what I'm saying, nature wouldn't express itself the way it is expressing yeah. itself. Because the way it is expressing yeah. itself includes my saying what I'm saying and you hearing what you're hearing. Yeah. And the other way around, you're saying what you're saying and my hearing what I'm hearing. So these are integral to this unfolding. Mm -hmm. There is nothing futile about my saying what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's not a waste of time because it provides an input to your own local algorithm yeah. and it will change things for you. Yeah. Now that change is unavoidable. Yeah. It would have happened anyhow. It, it would have it, happened. What is happening is happening. Yeah. And the would have been is our own yeah. uh, d delusion, but that delusion is itself part of the necessary unfolding of yeah. nature. I think it's part of the intrinsic potentialities and dispositions of nature mm -hmm. yeah. that certain dissociated perspectives within it uh -huh. think about could have been. <laughs> but um, know what I mean? I, I, I'm trying to, but I. Uh, to me, it's, it, it, I think the difficulty I have is with the sort of the ethical implications of this, of the moral implications of all of this. But I agree, your honesty is great because I've seen a video where Daniel Dennett, I think he's a denier of... Yeah, it, yeah, free will. free will denier, but he has this video, stop, say, uh, stop saying to people that they don't have free will. Because he, sa he's, he somehow thinks that it, it's just like it will sort of uh, uh, um, give uh, wrong incentives to people, you know, to... to yeah, to, to, that's to, treating people, people like children. I find this supremely <coughs> elitist and arrogant and... Yeah, let's I, face I just, the fact uh, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't have free will. It's just like, it makes you much more mildly because then you can look at like everything you judge like, oh, this should not be... It is, it is what it is. Like all the wars, all the crimes, everything in humanity, we all the suffering we invoke on each other, it's all what just nature, it is what it is. And the only thing I can do is like witness and play my part in giving... And you cannot help but play your part. And give this input variable to... to um, but to, to derive some form of nihilism from this, I think is the wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, where it's, you see that that's uh, sort yeah. of a... a, a, a it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, but it's a problem that arises from not seeing deep enough. Mm. Um, let me try to give you an example. I, I don't think nature is an algorithm. I yeah. think everything that happens is determined by what nature is, but that process of determination is infinitely more complex than our conception of an algorithm. Yeah. We are monkeys running around a rock for 300,000 years. I mean, who are we to think that yeah. our algorithmic capability reflects the full potentialities of nature's self-expression? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I'm not saying that nature is algorithmic. I'm saying that it's, um, its actions are determined by what it is. And what it does is what it irresistibly wills to do. Yeah. And what yeah. it needs to do is the expression of that irresistible will. The will yeah. and the necessity yeah. are one yeah. and the same thing. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But because we can only conceive of determination through algorithmic terms, mm -hmm. because we are monkeys, then I will surrender to that for the sake of argument. Just for the sake of argument. Yeah. Think about a, compu a computer. A computer is, an, is algorithmically determined. Yeah. We are chips in the computer. You are one chip, yeah. I'm another chip. And the computer goes through determined motions. That's why programs work. Yeah. Because the computer works in a completely deterministic way. <coughs> Engineers design according to the signal to noise ratio so we can eliminate any role for the noise. The noise doesn't play any role. If you remove one chip from the computer, it will not do what it needs to do. Hmm. And it will not run the program. Hmm. You see? Yeah. The, we are the chips. Yeah. Um, 
So take us out of the picture or in this would have been scenario in which we don't do yeah. what we are bound to do, yeah. the computer wouldn't run to completion. Mm. The universe wouldn't know itself. It can only know itself by expressing itself fully in a computationally reducible way. Yeah. Take one chip out and yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. So life is profoundly meaningful because each one of us is a chip yeah. in and the whole thing. experiencing the whole thing. Yeah. You take a chip out and it, it stops working. Yeah. So if I wouldn't say what I'm bound to say out of my irresistible will, which is an expression of nature, not Bernardo Castro, the algorithm wouldn't run. It wouldn't complete. Yeah. And the computer wouldn't know what it is yeah. because yeah. it can only know what it is by running something and yeah. taking yeah. account yeah. of that. Yeah. You see? So I have to say what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. whoever is listening to me has to listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. And it plays the other way around as well. I have to listen to the people I listen to. If they weren't saying what they were saying, I wouldn't be thinking what I'm thinking. I would lack an input yeah. to the chip that I am. And therefore, I wouldn't produce the outputs to the other chips mm. that need that yeah. output. Everything is profoundly meaningful. To say that it's unavoidable, because nature is what it is and not something else, is not to say that it's meaningless. Because every part in the deterministic system plays an, a, an indispensable role. That's the butterfly effect. If the butterfly in Mexico doesn't flap its wings, there is no hurricane in Florida. Yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have insisted a lot through the years that we have moral responsibility, mm. that we um, have to supervise the diamond as it expresses itself through us because the diamond is morally neutral. Yeah. So it's just as capable of curing cancer as it's capable of uh, killing 20 million people in a ravaging war of ultranationalism. Yeah. Uh, and we have the moral responsibility to keep the diamond within uh, moral bounds. And now people may then, may, may then say, it's useless you're saying that, Bernardo, because everything is... Uh, determined by what nature is. It just yeah, has to you play just itself told me, out. So what are you now saying yeah. that we do have sort of a free will thing to do uh, or to sort of... Because my saying, my saying that is part of the unfolding that may prevent another Hitler. No. And I, I, I am one of the chips. If I don't produce my outputs to the other chips, the algorithm mm. doesn't run to the end. It's unavoidable for me because of the irresistible will that expresses itself within me to say that we have moral responsibility. And because you heard that or other people heard that, their behavior will be other than it would have been had they not said anything. And it's all still determined by what nature is. But every part plays an indispensable role. You see what I mean? My saying this is input. So it's not futile that I say mm. everybody has moral responsibility. Because that's input that goes into their calculation about their next behavior. Yeah, but the only thing where you can derive meaning is the fact that, like, holy shit, the, the fact that I'm now so suffering about what's inflicted on me is very valuable input for the universe. I cannot help but suffer, uh, but it is feedback for the universe. Of course, of course, it's, it's, yeah. it's part of the mind of nature taking account of what it does. Yeah, I'm just super curious to the comments on this video because <laughs> yeah, I think people can sense I do not fully understand this. But this to me is like a lot of stuff you're saying is that it has to sort of sink in, I have to reflect on it and try to live it for a while or see what it does to me. But what I already can sense is that under a materialist worldview, uh, people hate the idea of sort of the clockwork mechanistic universe when you're just sort of uh, what's a radartje in it, uh, in, it in English? Uh, the dial. <coughs> Where you just this dial and um, you have no say in it and you just play your part. But we have a problem with that because we somehow think that consciousness and experience is like this accident or doesn't really as a dial as like a super small not even a real ro role to play. It's like just just an accidentally you have accidentally that dial that just does what it does and is determined to do what it does also has ha has an something that it thinks is an inner life and it suffers somehow 
and the, and the universe is not conscious. It does not even, you know, it just is. And that gives us this big problem, right? We were alone in the universe with our, in our lives and our and consciousness. But when you place that central, then in, in all of a sudden that becomes uh, very important, what the dial sort of experience is even more important than uh, the mechanistic script it plays out under a materialist world. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that, that to me is, I can sense that there's meaning there. I think there are some habits <coughs> of thought we have that, that obscure this whole thing. One of them is to think of determination always in terms of algorithms. Um, yeah. formal systems with uh, axioms and rules of derivation or theorems, the way the syntax of a language is constructed or logic rules are constructed. Um, and that's not what, I, what I'm proposing. I think the mechanisms, if they are mechanisms at all, if mechanism is, a, is the appropriate word at all, the means of determination are more suitably visualized as uh, organic mm. than algorithmic. Yeah. The reason I say that is that um, <clears throat> if organisms are what dissociated mentation look like, then the best metaphor for mentation is an organism. It's the best dashboard metaphor that we have for yeah. the processes of mentation. Yeah. So if you think of the universe as an organism, whose actions and inner, inner physiology are determined by what it is mm -hmm. because there is nothing else that mm -hmm. can determine it, mm -hmm. uh, then you're more in the right track to yeah. think of the universe, the operations of the universe as the physiology of an organism than the operations of an engine or a computer or a machine, an automaton of some sort. You're closer to truth, visualizing the universal unfolding as the physiology of an organism. It is still determined by what nature is. Yeah. It can't be anything else. But now there are more layers of depth and richness to how we think of the process of unfolding mm -hmm. than an automaton or an algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other habit of thought to get, I think I'm repeating myself now, but it's worthwhile to repeat this. The other bad habit of thought comes from this notion that your life is about you and my life is about me. Because only then do the choices of us as personal agents matter. If we are integrated in a larger organism, it's irrelevant whether we have individual choice or not. And we better not have, because otherwise the entire organism could become cancerous. What is cancer? Cancer is when some cells decide that they're going to make their own choices. Right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it's about. Yeah. And, and that leads to the end of the organism. It, it serves no purpose. Yeah, that yeah. is the meaningless hypothesis. The mm. meaningless hypothesis is precisely that we have full personal agency. Yeah. Oh, things can go wrong very quickly. Yeah. Um, but if we, you know, like Fred, uh, Fred Matz, or the founder of Essential Foundation and chairman, like he says, life is about allowing yourself to be played by nature. I find that a wonderful Phrase, metaphor. Yeah, yeah. You know, the metaphor is not you are playing yourself as an instrument. Yeah. You are the instrument that nature is playing. You are the violin in the hands of God. Allow yourself to be played. Yeah. That's your role. If you want good music, yeah. if you want the orchestra to play in unison like an organism, yeah. a non-cancerous organism, that's what it's about. And our role as individual agents or metacognitive agents is to pay attention, yeah. is to observe how we are being played, observe the inner struggle, uh, observe all the questions that arise and stop looking only at the outcome, yeah, uh, the yeah. decision, that it's not what, it, what it's about, it's about yeah. the process and observing that process. Uh, and then you become a healthy blossom on an apple tree that dies so that uh, there can be an yeah. apple yeah. and then there can be another apple tree yeah. later on. Um, so it's these bad habits of thoughts, mechanistic, algorithmic universe, personal agency, 
life being, being about us and not about nature. That's what leads people down the wrong path yeah. when they, they bite the bullet of nature being determined by what nature, is, nature is, which is yeah. a tautology. I think that's now, a beautiful... How could it be any different? Yeah. I think that's beautiful to close with, sort of the, the Fred Matzer quote, allowing you being played by nature. Allow yourself to be played. Yeah. yeah. And in future videos, we're going to dive deeper in what that allowance really means because, and that's what, nice because this discussion isn't finished. It does seem to imply it opens the door a bit for a bit free will again. So we're not done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for watching and please subscribe and uh, give your comments and questions and we'll definitely follow up with uh, future videos on topics like these.